Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aaron McIntosh. I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Act Zero. And joining me in today's fireside chat to discuss what makes for a good incident response plan is Adam Mansour, our Chief Security Officer here at Act Zero. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me here. A uh, quick housekeeping note before we get started. There are a number of tabs on uh, the right side of your screen or the bottom of your screen, depending on the setup. Uh, we are holding all questions until the end. If you do have any questions, please do use the questions tab to submit them, and we'll get to as many as possible at the end of the session. There's also an attachment tabs where we'll be referring you to certain documents throughout the session and for use and consumption later. That's available there. And of course, the rate us and feedback tab, um, we're always looking for feedback. What can we improve on? What resounded with you? Please enter your comments there, score us, and uh, we'll take that advice moving forward. So uh, the risk of a cyber attack on business is ever present. Uh, ensuring that you have a proper incidents response solution in place serves as a reliable method for identifying and tackling a security incident immediately. By doing so, you can limit damages and auditing and the reporting that's needed and work to ensure that it never happens again. Now, this being said, we know that all our, our plans are not considered equal. Uh, some might even fail that ultimate test when the time comes. Understanding the basic concepts of triage incident definition escalation is really important to your success. But there are many critical components in IR plans that can be too easily missed or devalued. So before we get started, uh, we do want to run a quick poll. Um, we'd like to understand where you are in terms of your own IR plan. Do you have one? Or are you developing it? So we have a few quick options here on the side. We'll run this about 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, take a chance, uh, lock in your answer. They're really simple. Um, the question is, what statement best reflects your current IR plan status? Um, IR plan, like, I don't know what that is. It's coming. That's You're working on it. Um, let's blow the dust off it. You've got it. It's sitting there. You really haven't done much with it for a while. Or the ultimate, which is, yeah, I had a plan. Um, if only people knew about it. Uh, or that could also be, yeah, I had a plan and it failed us at the last second. So we'll give everyone a few seconds to uh, respond to that. We're going to use the response on that to help guide our questions here in a moment. But, uh, you know, while you're taking that moment, uh, Adam, let's jump in. On IR plan, you know, what are some of the key things that you see that are going wrong with them at the moment? I think that there's a big tendency to try to write them first, right? You try to imagine the scenario. You're, you're writing the screenplay of, of how you see this working out. And, I think you know the, the, the tabletop sort of ends there, but it's really important to sort of sometimes start there, right? When you think about the tabletop, communication uh, should not be cumbersome, right? People draw these workflow diagrams or they try to involve all parties. It's this connect the dots of every person in the organization and you really don't wanna have you know, the communication flow waste a ton of time. I think that the, the key things you wanna try to do is define roles, really simple roles, roles that are interchangeable and that you know, every role in the company tied to a title, but roles in the incident response where multiple people can play, right? We have, you know, four or five fire wardens per office kind of thing, right? It's important to have backups. Uh, and then obviously understand the systems that you're gonna use for communication and their backups too. People need backups, systems need backups. These are the kinds of things that should float around when, when you start designing or, or going through uh, reviews of an incident response plan. And of course, templates, right? Everybody likes to leverage templates. And I don't mean the stuff you Google on the internet of word template for privacy policy. I mean, you know, communications templates. What are you actually going to send to people? How are you going to send it? It should be all text, you know, those kinds of things. Um, what kind of templates are you going to use for scenarios, right? Are you going to, you know, templatize the, you know, detections? Are you going to templatize ransom notes? What, what are you going to, what are you going to bring to the table? Um, to make it real, because sometimes people just have a tendency to talk, and then a lot of things aren't obvious when you actually go to try them in real life. Yeah. Uh, so before I jump on to the next session, um, I'm going to end the poll now. Uh, in terms of results, so coming in first place, we had 55% say, yes, I have a plan, if only other people knew about it. 33% uh, said, let's blow the dust off it. So that's a solid like 88% or so that are saying, you know, I've got something. So uh, my assumption is you're probably going to want to understand how do we optimize that. So we'll, a lot of our conversation will guide around that. And we had 11 or 12% of you as well say that, you know, IR plan, like I don't have one, I'm in that mix. So we'll definitely have to make sure we cover off that as well. And we'll talk about some assets that might be able to help you out with that as we go along. So, uh, Let's, moving on, you know, let's talk about what goes into the plan to make it better. 
you know, what are those essential components that, um, that uh, you should be including or even avoiding? I think you should always start without, you know, everybody starts listing scenarios, they start listing personnel, they start listing communications, you know, strategies and, and where the workflows go. You have to understand time, right? So this is a time sensitive thing. Uh, time is the most important thing you're going to measure in these, right? It's almost more valuable than the procedure is, is how you execute under pressure on how you execute under time constraints, right? And so that, that should dictate exactly what you're actually writing down because people don't have a lot of time to read <laughs> when, when these things are happening. So three, three big times I like to talk about breakout time, the time between an attacker moving from an asset they currently control with their you know, hands on keys to the next asset, right? Because that's really where you start to see uh, the impact rise tremendously. It's when most uh, you know severities go from medium to critical, right? Is that is that breakout time model movement? And so you, if you think about it, the average time you you know take some measures of the things that can be recorded by these incidents in companies like CrowdStrike try to track stuff like this. You know you have you know an hour and thirty eight minutes is kind of one of those averages, right? You also have dwell time. Dwell time is the amount of total time the attacker spends in your environment, right? And this could be days, months, weeks, et cetera. But obviously, if you have good detections, right, you've, you've got the ability to identify them. This is the time before they're identified, uh, but the time to identify them and how much time are you giving them on even a single asset. And that's what you really are striving for is to make sure that they're, you know, your dwell time's little and not the breakout time. And the last one is response time, right? What is the distance between your detection and response? Uh, in order to do that, you have to have the first one, which is that something has to send an alarm, right? So that, that usually has to happen in under a minute. You usually have, uh, you know, countermeasures, a triage, something that somebody's actually receiving. You'd be like, oh, a virus alert or whatever. Uh, that's 10 minutes, right? That's, that should be your goal there is keeping that detection uh, awareness, uh, you know, in around 10 minutes and the action's already sort of outlaid so that you're just acting within that first 10 minutes. And then you have 60 minutes for remediation. Right. And this is where, you know, most of your IR plan is actually focused is to try to make sure that you are, you know, not just containing and notifying the threat at the source. You've got your countermeasures laid out. The countermeasures usually are things like going dark. Uh, they are things like turning off machines, quarantining machines, the ways that you can insulate yourself uh, from further damage when you detect one, because where there's one, there's supposed to be more. Breakout time always leads to all time in every single scenario because they, they're not going to hold just one and a half hostage, right? And so the concept here is that those three sort of times, right? The breakout time, the dwell time, the response time, that should guide exactly what it is that you're trying to identify and block, right? Yeah. Um, once you're done kind of identifying times, I think now you can move to the roles, right? And roles are very uh, specific in incident response, right? You shouldn't have you know, that many roles. I know there's a lot of roles in the company and there's a lot of participants, but in an incident response, you, know, you, you really can't have the entire village work on the problem, right? You only have maybe the end user, right? You have IT who they usually talk to for technical issues of all kinds, right? These superheroes have to understand how to assign severity and move the move the ball, uh, you know, in another direction, which is towards actual cybersecurity practitioners. Maybe you outsource, maybe you have a SOC, maybe you have something else. And so it's important to go from help desk to SOC as fast as possible. If you don't know who that person is, you don't have the 911 ready, then realistically your incident response plan is more of a recovery plan. Um, after that, of course, you have once that person has contained and notified and, and you know, taken the, the attackers uh, countermeasures and, and put everything back, you have this longer tail issue, right, where you have infosec discussions on who should be notified, the company, the, the, um, the you know, insurer, the, the privacy offices. These infosec people are the ones that are supposed to be doing most of the communication. Right. Could you imagine if in the middle of the riots, you had somebody tapping the officers on the shoulder to be like, hey, can you tell me how long this is going to take? It's, it's the same level of nonsense that it is that you need to leave the incident responder alone. Somebody should be monitoring and communicating on their behalf, but they are laser focused on working against the adversary that's working every second on that computer to beat them. Right. Um, so, you know, it's important to understand that, that those are sort of the major four roles. Right. The end user has their own problems. How do they know if they're ransomware? How do they know who to contact? It should be very simple. They're not going to read the IR plan ever, ever, ever. So you need them to be able to, you know, escalate to one common source. That source needs to be able to keep things moving, you know, in one direction. And then if you think about it, there's going to be the reason to ensure that that communication has a few principles. It's always going one way, right? You go end user to this person. You don't have conversations going back and forth. 
because that's that immediately destroys that 10 to 15 minutes that you have to do this, right? So conversations go one way. End user says, I got a problem. You go, great. Basically quarantine the machine, move through your own incident response, get it to the incident responder, get that to the communications infosec people and not try to you know split hairs about, oh, let's, let's have conversations back and forth about whether this is or this isn't right. Uh, you should have the, the right level of intuition in those roles to be able to determine that. Um, and so the, the alerting systems, other reasons that you might not get them is because they may be down, right? If you got on-prem systems, if you've got you know, no backup communication systems, uh, it, this could be a problem for you even getting the notification in the first place. Um, and also it's important to understand that the distance between the alert and an actual action uh, is important depending on the severity. How are you getting that 24 hours a day, right? And if you think about the process, most people will get on these calls. I can't tell you how many MDR tabletops I've done where most of the tabletop is just communication about whether this is the right action or that's the right action. Whatever you actually say is the process is the process until the tabletop is over. Discussion about how to improve happens after the fact, right? So you should not you know, plague yourself with like, oh, I can do this. So there's multiple ways to do that. It's one process. And if it doesn't work in different situations, then we get to the next thing, which is how you sort of mutate that to uh, to work on the problem a little bit better next time where you don't have your superhero in the driver's seat or there's a procedure that not everybody can follow to find out what the host name and computer name is kind of thing. Yeah, and I think a lot of what you said is it really goes back to the where you started off, which is time, right? Anything wasted on, on non-compulsory effort uh, like updating your social media feeds and things like that. Uh, keep them informed, but you know, answering every single question is not important. Uh, you're racing against the clock with your adversary, uh, who's already got a head start on you, right? So, uh, let's jump on a little bit forward. Let's talk about recovery plans. So you've gone through the IR. Um, uh, you started through the IR process. You've kind of quarantined. You fixed that. What What would you include in an IR plan? Or so recovery. In a recovery plan, there's a lot of different, if you go through risk management, there's going to be a lot of different things. And when IT is involved, obviously, there's a lot of best practices that go around like incident, problem, change, the IT, you know, library, ITIL library of uh, the way that service management works, right? Is this something where we have to set up our, you know, status page to make sure that the service is up and running, it's green lights, you know, those, those incidents and those problems and those changes may be derived from a cybersecurity incident, but you're not going to include everything and anything in this IR plan. The plan needs to be something simple enough for those four roles to follow, right? And if they, if the four roles aren't capturing the templates, the communication systems, the procedures that allow them to, to walk through that something that will be very much tacit knowledge, knowledge that people know and don't look up at game time, um, you, you basically you know, don't want a full-blown recovery plan. Those methods of procedures, build books, the comeback plan from your VM backup and all these other things, those recovery plans are very different, right? They start to state the, 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 the controls that are in place. You know, we have an offline backup. We have multiple distant, you know, two different types of digital backups. We've got a cloud backup, you know, those kinds of things where your, your recovery plan is trying to assure other people that you've thought about scenarios ahead of time. So it's going to talk about everything from architecture to rebuilding specific apps. It's going to have communications processes to people that you're probably not going to, you know, involve in incident response, right? You're going to, you're going to involve them in rebuild after the fact, right? And so, you know, you, you, you contain your, your IR plan to, you know, very specific uh, timelines, right? That, that 11060 that we talked about, you're sort of in that 10, countermeasure remediation, contain, mm -hmm. notify, right? Once that is done, that's your incident response plan. Your recovery plan is a totally different plan. Right. And it may include a whole bunch of other things. Right. You talk about business continuity planning so through the pandemic. I think a lot of people have, you know, kind of practiced it before they, you know, did you ever look at what was written down when they said stay home for two weeks in that first, you know, in that first part? Probably yeah. not. Right. And, you know, you came up with a whole bunch of stuff that you did not come up with in real life. So, yeah. you know, was, was the plan servicing anything, you know, for most companies? Probably not. Did they expect the supply shortage of laptops, a global, you know, catastrophe? Probably not. Right. But leave those plans separate. Have those plans, practice those plans, practice backup and retention and, you know, recovery of your data different than you practice a tabletop. It's, the tabletop shouldn't be restoring documents from your backup server. Right. That's a very different thing. So. Um, I'd say that you try not to combine and confuse the IT plans and the other risk plans like continuity and disaster recovery with an incident response plan and try not to confuse the word incident. 
um, with you know your risk appetite score of an incident on you know your 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 you know uh, financials or something. Try not try not to make this so risk heavy that you're not focused on cyber and cyber is just testing incidents that are attacks and containing them and responding to them. Yeah, and interestingly enough, you talked about data backups. Um, I know it's not part of our conversation today, but I've seen and I've heard of people saying, yeah, we've got a data backup plan. They never tested it and it failed and then time came. So it's, there's always room for testing. And before we go into that, uh, I do want to toss a, another poll. Uh, and for those who uh, aren't aware on the, I believe it's on the sidebar of your screen, you'll see a little bar graph. Uh, that's where we do place the polls. So it should pop up for you as well. But the second poll we have is um, a simple, another simple question. It, which statement best reflects your IR testing procedures? Uh, those are, oh man, not another test. Didn't we just do that last week? Uh, we test in sync with daylight savings time changes. So like semi-annually, um, it's an annual tradition, just like Christmas, meaning you test annually or oops, we should really do that. Meaning that you actually don't have a regular scheduled IR planning session. So we'll open that up and uh, we'll allow you to take a second to go through that. Uh, but Adam, I will jump in and ask that question while people are responding. Um, you've spoken and written in the past about running fire drills when it comes to your IR plan. Um, any guidance for the today's audience on best practices there? Yeah, I think that a lot of people try to overly prepare. They try to invite a lot of stakeholders to the meeting uh, that, you know, they want to have a very well-oiled procedure. They want to show them that, you know, there's, there's very well-practiced, you know, responses and communication systems and they've got it covered within IT. I think you should probably start in IT. When we talk about test, 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 start with IT, right? If you've got a few members, maybe some friendlies, an application owner, uh, you know, an end user that you use to test new software on, it, use them to sort of go through the process, go through the tabletop yourself when you're testing stuff. Figure out where your own loopholes are before you bring in the broader team, right? No one wants to bring in their CIO and CEO and the, the in-house counsel and, you know, embarrass themselves in front of them, right? And, and there's a lot of pressure in those things to look very polished, right? And that's not how it is in the real world, right? Most most companies that go through an exercise like this, they're not doing it every day. You're not fighting an active adversary every day. You're at best, you know, chosen by based on some threat intelligence that they have on you uh, to, to come and attack you in the middle of the night where you're not even around, right? And so notice that there's, you know, a lot of things that you try to make right the first time that you probably, you know, won't. Probably better to go through a few scenarios to figure out where the gaps really are then try to imagine and, and get so much work ahead of time. Try not to do too much work there. Just start practicing right away. And then, you know, when we talk about, you know, making sure that the right things happen in the right order, that you understand communication flows happen in, in one way, that you're timing these things to stay under 15 minutes. And you're not moving further in the plan. You're not saying, well, let's get through the whole thing before we figure out if we can get to this 15 minutes. It really won't matter what you're doing, you know, after that 15 minutes or first hour if you don't get that first 15 minutes or hour right. That's the most critical time you have. If the communications plans and everything else are in there, you know, you have this concept that you're going to be able to, you know, go through that first critical hour and then start sending, you know, wider communications to people that probably have days to react or even in the case of something like a privacy loss, you know, 30 days, 45 days to relax or to react to notifying the privacy office. Um, so it's important to make sure that, you know, you, you, you can mix out different characters uh, in those incident response sense once you have that one first fluid thing. Um, you know, I think that we, we talk about it all the time, like what's best practice on practicing tabletops? And until you actually have it down, right, every week, right? Every week until you're ready, because what are you waiting for, right? Um, you know, every week until you're ready and then you can slow down, like, you know, once, a, you know, once every quarter or something like that. But you have to get it right once, go through the perfect version of this, switch people out, you know, take the, the superhero IT person out, put somebody else in, can they follow the procedures? Do they know where the documentation is? Do they know who to call? If you lose your, your perfect communication system, right? Your, your teams or something like that, how are you gonna get in touch with us? Do you have their cell phone numbers? Can you text them? Are those templates that you have for communications, these super cool and clean HTML documents from ServiceNow or are they text messages you'd get like when there's a thunderstorm in Austin, right? You gotta, you gotta come up with you know, the right uh, backup strategies for these things disappearing because they will, right? They won't be, you're planning for, you know, an IR disaster that is purposely focused on shutting down communications and your ability to act. Um, if they take your admin credentials and you only have one, 
you know, there's a million ways you, you kind of get, you know, uh, a surprise there. So practice perfect, uh, you know, execution until it's there and then switch people out. Yeah, it's like anything, right? It's, it's about muscle memory. You know, when you get people in the room, they know exactly what they need to do. Um, that one minute and those 10 minute sessions become much shorter every time, right? So um, I will throw out one last poll. This one's a little more uh, fun because we are talking about IR plans and we just wanted to leave you with this before we get into some questions that you may have from the audience. And that poll is, which of these is not a real disaster recovery or contingency plan? Uh, the first being the Svalbard uh, Global Seed Vault in uh, Svalbard, Nor Norway. The next is the uh, Zasavica Farm uh, Pool Cheese Contingency Plan. Uh, the next is the, uh, I'll leave the code out, but the, or it's the CFP CW 2016-905 Canadian Aged Whiskey Barrel Contingency Plan. And that's in case, you know, whiskey barrels go missing or uh, if something happens to the storage facility. Um, a roasting plant continuity plan, and that's to ensure the uh, coffee availability. And the CONOP 8888, uh, the U.S. counter zombie dominance. So I'll leave you with those. That's more fun if you have a second to go in. Uh, but I do want to jump into some audience questions uh, that we do have. Uh, we've got a couple coming in. Um, so let me go. To, I just see the number two. So I'm going to run to that. Uh, so the first one we have is, should our, our CISO be part of the tabletop exercise? Or VC, VC so sorry. Yeah, I mean, if you have a CISO, uh, their their job usually is to set up these guidelines, right? They're probably the one writing this stuff. They're the one telling you how it should be, and and the research that they're doing there is, you know, obviously like any risk, you know, personnel, they want to make sure they're doing the right, you know, tabletops for the right scenarios that are likely that are going to be, you know very damaging and that everybody that needs to be there should be there. So, you know, if they're not at least in the first few, um, that's, you know, important, right? Just to have them included to make sure that it runs smoothly. Uh, but the idea is that that person, you know, is likely in most companies, not necessarily a full-time practitioner that's going to have access to systems and everything else. So if you can't run it, it's kind of like training wheels. If you can't run it without the CSO, you're probably not going to run it in real life, right? Because you're, you know, calling that person, as much as I like to wake up in the middle of the night, and I do, <laughs> when people call me to be like, something's happening, um, we got to, you know, make sure that everybody knows how to play their role and play it effectively because this is, you know, full court press and every single person involved here has an, a role to play. And usually in, in game time, the CISO is not. Usually they're kind of at the back explaining to the insurer or figuring out recovery or some other type of analysis of why this actually went bad, right? Whereas, you know, IT and user incident responder, they're the ones on the field actually doing the job. So make sure you're testing with them. So first one, yes, after that, try to do it without them. Okay. Uh, I want to jump back into the poll that we had earlier as well, which was which statement best reflected your IR testing procedures? And just for the audience, so uh, you get that feedback, 14 of you percent, 14% uh, uh, of you said we test weekly or pretty close to, uh, which is fantastic. 57% uh, say it's an annual tradition. Uh, you test uh, once a year, so we encourage you to uh, make that more regular. And 28% uh, of you who said, oops, we should really do that. Uh, so we're here for guidance. If you are a customer right now, uh, reach out to us and we can walk you through that. We do have some assets and um, um, or if you're even a prospect and you're considering us, uh, reach out and talk to us and, and we'll talk about uh, some of our best uh, advice there. And secondly, before I do go on, um, we have the results of the other poll in right now. And that is, uh, which of these is not a real disaster? Oddly, so 14% of you said the Canadian aged whiskey barrel contingency plan. Uh, that is correct. That is one that I made up when I was writing this and looking at my Canadian whiskey on my shelf. 30% of you said the roasting plant continuity plan. That is, in fact, a, uh, a real thing. Uh, there's a backup for what happens if our crops go down and we're losing our coffee plants. And the CONOP 888, uh, the U.S. counter zombie dominance, that is an actual recovery plan. However, it is, uh, maybe a side note, that is somewhat fake. It does exist, but it's used as a training exercise for uh, U.S. military, but it does exist. So, uh, so maybe those 57% are correct in some way. Uh, but before we go on, we have about five minutes. Um, I do have one other question here for you, Adam. That is, do you have any advice for structuring debriefs and reporting? 
So my guess is that's based on, you know, what should we include in that report? Yeah, I, I guess, it, you know, if you're trying to run this, sometimes you have the, the the gold standard, right? Trying to run a red team, you know, exercise silently, figuring out whether you actually followed the plan, how you were able to detect what gave you a notification, what didn't, how long you could stay there. So those debriefs tend to go, uh, you know, very technical, a lot of, lot of numbers, a lot of percentages, a lot of you know, uh, risk tables, right? Anybody that's looked up FAIR uh, or, you know, these other frameworks can, can give you kind of alignment to the risks and frequency of them. So you're really just saying, you know, here's the weight to why we tested this and how important it was and how we did relative the averages. Uh, I tend to, to hate doing things that way because it, nobody ever really tightens the, the communications and the issues and gets more people involved with that, right? I like to just focus the debrief on times and where people made mistakes, right? Just to say, look, you know, you spent too much time in IT trying to diagnose what was going on. You needed to go dark earlier, right? You spent way too much time communicating with each other and you didn't need to. You didn't need to tell the end user, hey, what's your workstation name? You really didn't, right? And so, you know, the concept is that if you keep going through iteratively and make it very simple to open your next IR tabletop as the reporting of the last one to be like, as you'll remember from the last episode, our hero fell down here, right? Then you, you have this concept that you, you understand what you're iterating. It also teaches people the lesson, if it's the same people in the room, that we had a mistake the first time. Watch for that this time. You did everything right here, here, and here, and you messed up here. And then they know, okay, I'm going to make sure to, to not ask the end user for their workstation. I'm going to make sure not to ask what the privacy office's link is before we're done containing the, the incident, right? I'm going to go forward. Um, with, with uh, making sure that for my responsibility in my role, which is where all your focus should be on, I'm not going to affect the time. I'm going to, it's hot potato. I'm going to move it as fast out of my hands as possible, which I know that's not how you play hot potato. But you know, <laughs> that's that's the, the ideal, is to report on times to rules and basically where you messed up to be like, we got to fix that. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So closure, we have about a minute and a half left. So uh, I want to take some time to uh, thank you, Adam, for joining us again today. Um, always a pleasure. And I know this time goes by really, really quickly. And uh, as mentioned, uh, we do have a number of available assets uh, to help you plan your IR uh, strategy, build your IR plan, optimize it if you already have one. So we'll be providing to you the IR planning template um, it's available, it should be in the links available for you on the side attachments, and we can email those out later as well. Um, our IR versus AIR, we didn't really get into that, but uh, there are services available for advanced IR when you need to get into deep dives and, and forensics and things like that. Uh, we do have to make those services available to our customers. Um, as well, uh, for anyone who is considering cybersecurity insurance, uh, we do have a promotion going on right now where you can receive up to 20% off your insurance renewal and or towards money that would go towards those premiums. So do reach out to us and we'll give you a little bit more information on that as well. Uh, and so that's it. You know, thanks again to you audience members for joining us. If we didn't get to any questions or you happen to have any questions afterwards, please, please do let us know at info at x AI and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And don't forget to provide your feedback as well. Thanks all.